Some routines become part of family tradition over time. One of the things I will always associate with the weekend is my dad putting Formula One on the television and watching as screeching fast cars roared around in circles for about an hour and a half. Every weekend, the sound of engines, the delight of the over-enthusiastic commentators, the glory of that podium finish at the end. Sometimes I would watch. More often, I'd probably break out my own toys, sit on the lounge floor and wait for the spectacle and the roaring to finish and the moment that I could reclaim the living room for playing again. Living through that, week after week, year after year, some elements of the culture were bound to become embedded in my psyche. You pick up names, faces, references to people who are only ever mentioned with respect to their legendary skills and speed. Amongst the upper echelons of Formula One stardom, there are several names worth recording but only one crossed over into my other passions of life. I didn't know who he was or what he represented, but I knew that everybody was interested in Ayrton Senna, possibly the world's fastest driver ever. An unparalleled sportsman winning 41 Grand Prix titles. An international globe-trotting celebrity. It was a coup for Sega to attract him to endorse their racing game. But how did this legendary combination come about? The arcade cabinet of Super Monaco GP was built to resemble the legendary McLaren racing car, meaning that players could literally climb behind the driving wheel take a turn around the legendary Monaco circuit and pretend for a moment that they were this magnificent racing superstar. There had been several versions of this cabinet as Sega evolved the sprite-based scaling technology to more vividly relay the spectacle of high-speed racing. This was long before polygonal 3D graphics would reach the general video gaming market, so for the time this was very impressive hardware. So much so that in 1989 this cabinet was the third highest grossing arcade game in Japan, behind Sega's own version of Tetris and Namco's winning run. And Sega were not beyond approaching sporting celebrities to attach their name to their games. However, most endorsements in this era were handled by Sega of America, who simply handed over a paycheck and slapped a local sporting hero's name onto whatever product Sega of Japan had ready for them to import at the time. Formula One is one of the world's most recognisable sports, but it isn't as large in the United States as it is in other countries. So Ayrton Senna would not have the kind of brand recognition that they wanted. Instead, the deal came about because as Sega had rapidly expanded around the globe, they had realised that there were too many markets for them to handle themselves. In some territories, they sold on their stock and their intellectual property to third-party resellers to manage the local area on their behalf. One such agreement they had was with Tectoy, a company who negotiated with Sega for total liberty to manage all Sega products in the Brazilian market. Tectoy was, even is still today, a fascinating company who managed to achieve an astounding 80% market share of the video game market in that country, producing and selling copies of the Sega Master System and Mega Drive consoles to a receptive public long after the global market had died out. Tectoy's head office was in Sao Paulo, which happened to be Ayrton Senna's hometown. Tectoy manager Stefano Arnhold skipped Sega of America and went directly to Sega of Japan in mid-1991 to suggest to them that they made an Ayrton Senna specific game. Or well, Sega was already working on a sequel to the arcade game, a Super Monaco GP2, and to them they thought a celebrity endorsement sounded promising, so they did agree to reach out. Unfortunately, the initial response was negative. Senna had no interest in having his name associated with any old driving game. No. If he was going to get involved, he wanted to help make the game and ensure it was as good as possible. There was negotiation and, in the end, Ayrton gained producer and supervisor credits for the final product, and his cousin, Fiori Mercado, was credited as the project manager. Senna wanted to make the game as authentic as possible. He really was committed to his sport, and he wanted others to share that passion. So if Sega wanted to trade with his name, then direct personal oversight of the game's production was a deal breaker for him. That October, he and Arnhold travelled together to Japan in October to visit the development team at Sega headquarters. Reports say that when he arrived at the building, the 400 strong staff downed their tools and they scrambled to welcome him into the suite. What was meant to be a quick 40 minute meeting with the development team turned into a three hour tour and autograph signing session. Although he did achieve what he'd set out to do amongst all of that, which was brief the dev team on what it was really like to be a Formula One driver. 
The team took copious notes on car handling, speed, and most importantly, the use of rumble strips. Senna told them that one of his peeves about current racing games was the way that they punished you for straying onto the rumble strips by automatically slowing your speed. No, Senna explained, the rumble strip is there to provide feedback that you are close to the edge, but its purpose is not to slow you down itself, it's to provide sensation. Pro drivers use the rumble strip to help with cornering, to help them achieve the fastest racing line possible, and they should change that for the new game to make it more realistic. Happy he was being taken seriously, Senna also pitched three new courses, an addition to the 16 Grand Prix tracks, specifically designed by him. And when the meeting was over, Senna agreed for the game to use his name. He even got his manager to provide VIP passes for the dev team for the Japanese Grand Prix, the real reason he was in the country, where they all watched him and Gerhard Berger complete a 1-2 finish for the McLaren Honda team. But even then there were difficulties. Hidden in the game, there are text tips written by Senna about each of the Formula 1 tracks. Each of them a condensed summary of recordings that Senna made and sent to Sega that autumn to include in the game. The original plan had been for these to be on the cartridge as full voice clips, but a shrinking project budget meant that these had to be cut. However, whilst he was keen in principle, Senna objected to writing a review of the brand new Barcelona track because, as of summer 1991, he hadn't raced on it yet. Senna point blank refused to record his thoughts on the track, nearly putting the whole release of the game in jeopardy until they reached a compromise. Senna raced the inaugural Spanish Grand Prix in November, coming fifth behind the Williams Renault and Ferrari teams, and he recorded his thoughts on the track that very day after finishing. The game was then released in summer 1992, and the Mega Drive version was immediately highly praised for its improvements over the first game. Several outlets claimed it was the best console racing game they'd ever seen, although the improvements were largely incremental over the previous entry. Replaying it now, I'm impressed at how smooth the graphics are for an early Mega Drive title. And whilst the game elects to forego music during the race in favour of a realistic engine sound, I realise how much the developers focused on immersion. Formula One racing isn't like some other forms of racing. It's a very lonely, isolationist sport. Every lap is like its own personal time trial. You're pushing yourself to get on the racing line to be the best that you can be. This isn't a sport that largely rewards flashy acrobatics, but a focus on consistency and memorization. The game always gives you one warm-up lap to get the feel of the track before the race begins, and whilst there are always other drivers to avoid, they are secondary obstacles after focusing on the track itself. The goal is always to retain momentum, to come out of each corner with as much speed as possible so you'll work your way up the pack piece by piece. Drop the gear, let go of the throttle, dive into the turn, and then back on the throttle as soon as it's safe to do so. I'm convinced the game largely helps you to make these tight turns. It's far more forgiving than some of the other games of the era I've played. As long as you try to make the turn, it'll help you. Small collisions can be forgiven. Whilst the rumble strip is nothing to fear, there are tyres or trees on the edge of the track that are real obstacles. Clip them or another driver and you'll halve your speed instantly and you'll have to accelerate back up to the racing speed again and watch yellow car after car slip past you as you go. However, hit one of the tyres head on and it will bring your race to a sudden and shuddering halt. I was impressed to see the game has tunnels, uphill and downhill elevation, even wet weather programmed in. All of the different countries are subtly different, all done with the aim of making you feel like a Formula 1 driver, all done to help you focus on your own skills as a racer. This was, and remained, one of the most highly regarded racing games on the Mega Drive console, and a touchstone for gaming fans around the world. It really is a treasured Mega Drive entry, and easily the biggest selling driving game for the system. But why didn't it receive further acclaim? Why is history seemingly forgotten this landmark title? In part, there's the fact that Formula 1 just doesn't have the brand recognition in the United States that it has everywhere else in the world. But I think there's another reason. In a cruel twist of fate, the game's release was followed almost immediately by one of the most famous 2D racing games in history. Nintendo had been working on the Mode 7 graphics engine for their own console, and that autumn they released Super Mario Kart for the SNES. A kart racing game that went in almost exactly the opposite direction to this. Rather than be realistic, it's cartoony and charming. Rather than focus on the intensity of driving, it treasures the thrill and the fun, 
with combat against other drivers who are all animated and well characterised. In short, it's everything Super Monaco GP2 isn't. Video racing games changed after the release of Super Mario Kart, introducing a whole new subgenre of kart racers that exploded in popularity. Meanwhile, the dawning age of 3D graphics was just around the corner, meaning that the game sits awkwardly in the middle between the golden age of arcade machines and the 3D realistic racing simulators that would follow. It's an important historical footnote. The first time a video game franchise tried to realistically follow the Formula 1 formula as close as possible. Surely there should have been a sequel. Yes, Sega was clearly keen on one. In 1993, Sega sponsored the British Grand Prix race at Donington Park, offering a Sonic Formula 1 trophy to the winning racer. The whole track was covered with Sega branding, and the racers and track team were handed Game Gear consoles to try out. The winner of the race would receive the legendary Sega Sonic trophy, and true to form, Senna pulled out a masterstroke of driving to claim the trophy. It still sits at McLaren headquarters on display. Sega and Senna had wanted to explore a sequel, but sadly, in May 1994, after a devastating crash at the Imola racetrack in Italy, Ayrton Senna died of several devastating wounds following a collision with a concrete retaining wall. The world watched in horror as a racing legend was lost forever. A man whose antics both on and off the racing track had touched thousands of people's lives one way or another. Ten years after his death, it was calculated that his grave in Brazil attracts more visitors than John F. Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley combined. A true national treasure. I was barely aware of this drama at the time. For me, Senna was a name that I'd heard spoken only occasionally and with awe and reverence. Senna, the name that everybody said was the best that I had ever been. The man with a kind smile who wanted me to be the best I could be on that racing game I had in the cupboard.